from 1 Chronicles chapter 21, and we'll begin reading at the 18th verse. The word of the Lord says this, Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up, set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat, and as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein and to the Lord. Thou shalt grant it to me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give. Everybody say give. I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meat offering. And I want you to notice these four words. I give it all. And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight, and David built there an altar unto the Lord, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord, and he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. I want to speak to you for... A few moments this evening on this subject, a blessing disguised as a sacrifice. A blessing disguised as a sacrifice. Could we just lift up our voices one more time all across this house and ask God to bless his word as it goes forth. God, I thank you for your presence that fills this place. I thank you for every individual that is here, and I pray that your word would have free course, Lord. Anoint my mind, my mouth, Lord. Anoint my, everything about me. I pray that we will help help us, help, help us, help us to be more like you, Lord, to have greater faith in you. Help us in Jesus' name to draw closer to you. Lord, I pray that you'll move upon the hearts of every person in this place. Oh, Lord, that we will trust you to a greater degree than we have ever trusted you before. We thank you for this, Lord, and we give you praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. The word sacrifice is no strange word to us. We are familiar with it. We know what is intended by its use. In fact, you can't really find a successful person who will not talk to you about sacrifice. Regardless of what they have accomplished, you can scour their life and you will find those particular points in time where sacrifice was needed to bring them to the place of success. Whether it be in the area of business, whether it be in the area of education, whether it be in the area of athleticism, regardless of the feat, regardless of the effort, to be successful, it always requires sacrifice. Sacrifice means that you lay down something that is precious, something that is precious to you, and you just simply lay it down you don't you don't think about really what it is you just simply lay it down and 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 you do so with the knowledge that if you will deprive yourself of this thing in this moment that it will come back to you in greater measure and and you do so for the good of whatever cause you are hoping to obtain and 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 so this is the concept of sacrifice and whether you're talking about the great the great uh, entrepreneurs of history or the great commanders of history or the great uh, athletes of history the great orators of history the great poets of history 
You, can, you can't find successful people who can't talk about sacrifice. They all can tell you about those days when they did without. They can all tell you about those days that they, that they put it all on the line, where they lived well, well beneath their means, where they, where they even went hungry, where they just laid it all out on the line. And, and, and you wouldn't know it now because now you see the after picture if you please you you look upon them with great awe and think how great it is to be them you might even think they're lucky but but it's not luck they would tell you oh no 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 it's it's sacrifice it is a principle that when you sow you shall reap it is a spiritual principle yes but but it is true across the spectrum Whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. The Bible explains that we should not be deceived. And it tells us that God is not mocked. That whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And, and then the warning comes. That if you sow to the flesh, you shall reap of the flesh corruption. But if you sow to the spirit... You shall reap of the Spirit life everlasting. And so we say unabashedly, sow to the Spirit. Amen. Sow in prayer. Sow in fasting. Sow in worship. Sow to the Spirit. Because this concept of sacrifice, though it is well known the world throughout, The concept of sacrifice is not a worldly concept. It's a biblical concept. The world gets their understanding of sacrifice from the Bible. The Bible is, in fact, the the, the actual origin of the idea that sacrifice is what works. In fact, the Bible describes that Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain you actually see a picture of someone who sowed to the spirit and someone who sowed to the flesh when you have Cain and Abel Cain offering a a sacrifice that was of the fruit of the ground but Abel offering a sacrifice that was a firstling of his flock this this was a sacrifice that pleased God that the scripture says was a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. When Noah came off of the ark of God and the Lord had, had so miraculously and so mercifully and graciously kept him and his family from the devastating, ravaging waves of the flood, Noah came off of that ark and the Bible says he offered sacrifice unto the Lord we see in the construction of the tabernacle that Moses was directed of the Lord and he gave direction to Aaron and the sons of Aaron and those those individuals of the tribe of Levi who were priests he gave them instructions that they were to offer sacrifices and these sacrifices they ranged across the board there were goats and and calves and lambs and There were uh, doves and so forth and there were sin offerings and burnt offerings and trespass offerings and they were to be offered unto the Lord and they were to be done at different times of the year and there were all these specifications and there were all of these rituals involved and there were ceremonial cleansings involved for the priests and and even of the animals and and they were to be spotless and blemishless and, and it was this ongoing ongoing instruction to the very meticulous detail that there was to be sacrifice and it was all throughout the the old testament and the implementation of the tabernacle worship and and it even went into the temple worship as beautiful as the temple was that solomon built and the bible would refer to the beauty of this temple in such unique ways it would it would even when trying to describe something so beautiful Jesus said consider the lilies how they toil not neither do they spin yet Solomon arrayed in all of his glory in thinking of the most glorious and beautiful expression of 
of, of, of human excellence, he pointed us to Solomon and said, that's the picture of, of, of just human excellence. And, and yet Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of these. That temple Solomon built was magnificent with all of the ivory and the, the gold and the brass and the, all of the marble and, and, and all of the design, the intricate detail of its design. But when they dedicated that temple, as beautiful as it was, as modern as it was, it, it, it still involved sacrifice. They, they walked those goats in, they walked those lambs in, they walked those sacrificial animals in, and they sacrificed them, and that blood went everywhere. Sacrifice isn't pretty. Sacrifice is very involved, and it's very difficult. Sacrifice is very painful. Sacrifice is something that you feel, but, but they would sacrifice these animals, and and this was all throughout the Old Testament. But you have to understand that all of these sacrifices of the Old Testament were pointing to the one sacrifice. They all symbolized the one sacrifice that, that actually was the sacrifice. And the Bible calls it the perpetual sin offering. The Bible refers to it as, as a sacrifice of perpetuity, one that... Once it is accomplished, it is, it is forever settled. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And it was pointing to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ was the sacrificial lamb. Every lamb that was offered in the old covenant all pointed to him who would take away the sins of the world. The, the, the sacrifice of all of these other animals, they would, they would atone man's sin or they would defer the penalty of man's sin. They would push back the debt that man owed. But when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed, hallelujah, I want you to know Jesus paid it all. <laughs> hallelujah, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but Jesus washed it white as snow. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lamb of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That was you and I that was supposed to be on that cross. It was you and I who should have suffered the penalty of crucifixion. It was you and I who deserved to die. But God, in his relentless mercy, God, in his everlasting love, God, in his tender mercies and his loving kindness, the agape love of God he reached down his hands and saved us from that destruction taking it upon himself oh friend he paid the ultimate price he shed his blood so that you can be saved he laid down his life so you and I could live forever hallelujah hallelujah that is the ultimate sacrifice. And the Bible says that he was wounded for our transgressions. Not for his transgressions, but for our transgressions. He was bruised not for his iniquities, but for our iniquities. It was not the chastisement of his peace that was upon him. It was the chastisement of our peace that was upon him. It was with his stripes that we are healed. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He was dumb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. Hallelujah, I'm talking about the ultimate sacrifice. Calvary's hill of sorrow when Jesus laid down his own life so that you and I could live forevermore. The ordinances of the law, the statutes of that old law were nailed to his cross. And he took upon himself the iniquity of us all when he said that he would, that this cup 
would pass from him. He was referring to the cup of trembling. He was referring to the cup of judgment that, that, that the book of Psalms references. And in that cup was a mixture that was bitter, that was full of anger and indignation of God. And that cup was going to turn over upon humanity. But God was manifest in the flesh so that he could take the cup, so that he could take the punishment, so that he could take the penalty, so that he could take the indignation of God. This is why the Bible says it pleased the Father to bruise him. Hallelujah. Not because the Father is cruel, but because the Father had come in flesh and took upon himself the indignation we had coming to us. Yeah, there's a reason why we dance before the Lord with all our might. There's a reason why we shout before him with gratitude, hallelujah, and thankfulness in our heart. There is a reason why why we serve him all the days of our life there is a reason why we're consecrated and we're devoted and we're committed and anything he commands us to do we'll do it <laughs> hallelujah because when I should have died he gave me the ability to live when I deserved to be cast into a devil's hell tormented in a lake of fire the Lord took my iniquity upon himself oh hallelujah glory to God hey and if I'm going to preach this much of the gospel to you I might as well take it all the way and tell you that if you want this to be appropriated and applied to your life then you must repent of your sins be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost Ah, glory. Hallelujah. You can't talk about sacrifice without referring to the ultimate sacrifice. We can't talk about what it means to lay it all down without talking about the moment in time, the moment in scripture where it was all laid down. We must look to the cross of Jesus Christ. And it is not a pleasant seen this cross of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul told the church at Corinth when he came upon that great city and preached the gospel to them, this was a city that was completely debauched. This was a city that was completely perverse. This was a city that had their ideas all upside down and inside out. And the apostle Paul didn't bother with trying to correct the symptoms of the issue. He said, I came not to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, but I came to you in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. He said, I knew nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. If I can get your eyes fixed upon the cross of Jesus Christ, if I can let you know who he is and what that cross represents, oh friend, there's nothing you won't do for him. There's nothing you won't do to... <laughs> Hallelujah. If he wants you to serve him, you'll serve him. If he wants you to go, you'll go. If he wants you to lay it all out, you'll lay it all out. When you know about that sacrifice. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't want to sugarcoat the sacrifice. It was real sacrifice. It was wounds. It was bruises. It was blood. It was thirst. It was giving up the ghost. It was pain. It was sorrow. It was affliction. It was smitten of God. It was, it was abandonment. It was forsakenness. It absolutely was as bad as you can possibly imagine it to be. And this is the very sacrifice around which all sacrifice revolves. Hallelujah. And yet... It was a blessing disguised as a sacrifice. Because three days later, listen. As bad as it was, as heartbreaking as it was. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. 
hallelujah as strenuous as it was as difficult as it was as bloody as it was as painful as it was three days later up from the grave he arose triumphant over death hell and the grave I said up from the grave he arose glory hallelujah I'm talking to you about real sacrifice. When we're talking about sacrifice with God, we're not just talking about death and burial. We're talking about death, burial, and resurrection. He rose with healing in his wings. He rose with forgiveness in his name. He rose with power in his hand. When I talk to you about sacrifice, yes, I'm talking to you about blood. Yes, I'm talking to you about pain. Yes, I'm talking to you about loss. Yes, I'm talking to you about laying it all down. But that's not all I'm talking about. But I'm talking about when you lay it all down. I don't know how to explain it. I I don't know what all goes into it. I just know that when you put it into the providence of God, when you lay it down into the perfect will, hallelujah, of the holy God, something begins to happen to that sacrifice. Something begins to shift and shake. Hallelujah. Things get put into order. Things get reversed. Things get moved around. And that sacrifice begins to multiply. That sacrifice begins to begins to morph into something greater than it ever was hallelujah and it comes marching back out of wherever you put it hallelujah greater and stronger and more in number I know it looks like a sacrifice it sounds like a sacrifice it feels like a sacrifice it's got all the earmarks of a sacrifice but I promise you it's a blessing disguised as a sacrifice hallelujah don't be afraid to obey God God told Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham took Isaac out into the, into the land of Moriah and, and didn't even know where he was going. But as he took him, the Lord said, I'll tell you when you get there. And when they arrived, the Lord said, this is it. And Abraham looked and said, all right. Looks at his servants and says, I'm the lad will go yonder and I and the lad will worship and I and the lad will come again to you. Hallelujah. I, I know God said I'm going to have to offer him. But I, 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 but I understand the way the blessings of God work. The blessings of God come as sacrifices. They look like a sacrifice. But if you will just embrace them, you will find that locked inside that sacrifice is a greater blessing than you have ever known before. Abraham takes Isaac up to the Mount Moriah. And on their way up, Isaac starts getting a little suspicious. And he sees the wood and he sees the knife. He sees all the ingredients of a sacrifice. Says this sure looks like a sacrifice. But I don't know where the lamb is. And we passed every opportunity to get a lamb. So he's he's starting to wonder where the lamb is. Or better yet, who the lamb is. And he asks his dad, said, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide himself. Hallelujah. Did you catch that little messianic prophecy? God will provide himself a lamb for a sacrifice. He walked Isaac up to the top of that mountain and he wasted no time. There was no hesitation in his step. He just grabbed his knife, sharpened it up, laid the wood in order, laid Isaac upon the wood, strapped Isaac to the wood. Now Isaac was a grown man, so he and Abraham both are are being obedient to God. Isaac could have ran away, but they're both 
being obedient to God. He lays Isaac down upon the wood, straps him down, lifts that knife. He's getting ready to sacrifice him. And the angel of the Lord said, stop. Chill. (laughs) Now I know that you fear God. And behind Abraham was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham took the ram and offered him in the place of his son Isaac. And he called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. Hallelujah. That's where we know how God is a provider. Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is my provider. Abraham knew the whole time this sacrifice was not the end of the story. Hebrews 11 tells us that Abraham had accounted that God was able to raise Isaac up from the dead if it was needed. He didn't know how. He didn't know when. He didn't know where. He didn't know what. All he knew was that God gave me this promise and it is impossible for God to lie. So even if he has to raise him up from the dead, I'm coming back down from this mountain with my son and we're going to keep on living for God together that's why you should never be afraid to obey God it may look like a sacrifice but it's a blessing in disguise it may feel sacrificial it may sound sacrificial but it's just a blessing in disguise Hallelujah. I have watched people obey God blindly, obey God with open faith and open heart only to find out the very thing they thought they'd have to do without, they wouldn't have to do without it at all. God was never going to require it. He was just trying to bless them. And that's the way it worked in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. The Bible says that there was a great pestilence that had broken out upon Israel. David had numbered Israel against God's will and God's command. And David numbered all of Israel. And now he had aggrieved God. And he had three choices. Either he would have three years of famine. Or three months of war. Or three days of pestilence. And David wisely chose the three days of pestilence. Because he said I would rather fall into the hands of God. Than into the hands of man. Hallelujah. For three days, pestilence raged and thousands of people died in the middle of that pestilence. And David was scrambling and seeking refuge. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord stood near the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And the prophet Gad came to David and said that he must go to that threshing floor and he must offer a sacrifice. And so David goes to the threshing floor and Ornan the Jebusite is there. He's a wealthy man. He owns the threshing floor. He has lots of, uh, he has lots of animals and lots of, 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 of food and he has lots of instruments for threshing and, and he's, just, he's a businessman and he's got all that you need to run a good business. And David the king walks up on his threshing floor and the angel of the Lord is standing nearby with a sword drawn in his hand. Ornan is threshing wheat on his threshing floor And here comes David. And the Bible says that David looks to Ornan and says, Grant me the threshing floor. I need to offer sacrifice to the Lord in order to stay this plague. And Ornan said, I will give it to you. And David said, I will not let you give it to me. For I will not offer unto God anything that doesn't cost me something. He said, I'm going to pay the full price for this threshing floor. And Ornan the Jebusite, and we do do exalt the nobility of David, and we should. It was a noble thing that David said and did. But I want you to notice what Ornan the Jebusite did. Ornan the Jebusite said, you don't have to give me anything for this threshing floor. He said, I'm going to give you the threshing floor. He said, I'm going to give you the oxen for the burnt offering. I'm going to give you the threshing instruments for the wood. I'm going to give you the wheat that I have, that I have in store. I'm going to give you all of my food, all of my animals, all of my tools. I'm going to give you all of my property. And he said these four words, I give it all. In that moment, Ornan had given everything he owned to the king. 
bowed at his feet. I give it all. And in that moment, he lost everything he ever worked for. Only to hear the king say, no, I'm paying you full price for everything you own. I'm going to make you completely 100% liquid just like that. You're not going to ever have to worry about depreciation ever again. I am paying full price for everything you have. Ornan went from losing everything to entering into the largest windfall of his life. That is the way sacrifice works. When you decide to give it all and actually do give it all to God, God will give it to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. We listen. It is not apostolic to be stingy. It is not apostolic to be greedy. It is not apostolic to be a hoarder. It is not apostolic, listen to me, to be some kind of a cheapskate when it comes to the things of God. When it comes to moving the mission, we give it all. All of my time, all of my talent, all of my treasure, everything I have, it belongs to you. Well, Brother Urshan, don't you think we should have something? Oh, see, see, you missed the point. You think I'm just talking about sacrifice. I'm not just talking about sacrifice. I'm talking about a blessing disguised as a sacrifice. Because when you give it all, it all comes back to you. Don't ask me to explain it. I don't know how it works. I just know that it does happen. I know that when you sow to the Spirit, you reap of the Spirit. Life everlasting. I I don't know how to explain it. I just know that when you lay it all down, you give it all to God, and you say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with everything. I'm going to trust you when it doesn't make sense. I'm going to trust you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and finances. God gives it all back to you with interest I've seen it happen over and over and over and over again in our building campaign we're getting ready to complete our building in Cincinnati Ohio a beautiful new uh, campus and we're so thankful to God for it one of the men in our church when we were raising the funds miracles I could spend the rest of the night telling you financial miracles of those who gave everything they had and, and God gave it all back to them Twofold, tenfold. This man said, Lord, I was, I was, as pastor, I was calling upon people to make sacrificial commitments. And this man and his wife had just had a, a, a very terrible medical issue and challenge with their little baby that was born premature. And she spent months in the hospital in the NICU and And they didn't know if she was going to live, but God brought her out. And she's a beautiful little girl running around our church today. Amen. But this man had $50,000 worth of bills sitting on his desk at home, medical bills that insurance wasn't going to cover. And he he was going to be responsible for these $50,000 worth of medical bills. And the pastor is up calling for sacrificial financial commitments. And his heart is being stirred because he wants to participate in giving to the work of God. But how in the world am I going to give when I've got all of this responsibility? This this weight is attached to me. He came to the front to pray and said, I I was telling them God's going to give you a number. He's going to put a number in your spirit and that's the number you're to give. God's going to give you a number to give. And this man stood there and said, Lord, I don't know what you want me to give. I don't have anything. And every little bitty thing I get is going to have to go to these medical bills, $50,000. Lord, how much do you want me to give? And the Lord said, this is how much you're going to give, $50,000. 
He said, Lord, that's going to the medical bills. The Lord said, I'll take care of the medical bills too. But you're going to give $50,000. For the first year of our giving campaign, he gave nothing. He couldn't give anything. He didn't have anything to give. And then all of a sudden, he started giving what he could. And he did give that $50,000. And after he gave the $50,000 and the medical bills were paid off as well, the Lord said, I want you to give another $50,000. He gave another $50,000 and has more to give. I don't know how to explain that. I don't know what happens there. I just know that something in the spirit begins to happen when people cast their bread upon the waters. Ah, 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 ah. Woo, hallelujah. Something begins to happen. We had one man in our church who could not, could not find a job. He had applied all over the city and there were no jobs that were hiring him. They would not hire him. He had put his application anywhere and everywhere that he could. And he and his wife had made commitments. She was working and she was giving what they could and, and they were to give an annual offering and the annual offering was coming due soon. But there was a little discretionary. They could give it when they needed to or wanted to. And, and the man came down one day after six months of looking for a new job came down and said to his wife on a Sunday morning with tears he said we have to give our annual commitment today and she said today he said yes she said that's that's what we have in our savings he said we have to give it today she said well could we wait till you get that job and he said no I have to give it today they gave it that day on the next day they received a call from the University of Cincinnati. The University of Cincinnati said, hey, did you apply here for a job six months ago? He said, yes, I did. They said, well, we don't have that job open, but we've created a new job just for you. I don't know how to explain that. Not only did he get the, the job, but now all of his children are going to have free tuition at the University of Cincinnati, Ohio, because he was willing. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how to explain it. But I'll tell you, sacrifice isn't just sacrifice. It's never just sacrifice. It's never just crucifixion. It's always resurrection. It's never just I give it all. It's always you're going to get full price in return. It's never, it's never just take your son to the mountain and offer him there. It's always God's going to show up with a miracle in his hand. Hallelujah. In our own situation, our own testimony, when we were giving to the campaign, there was a, there was a way that we had budgeted for our church. We sent everybody through a budgeting uh, priority, and they would determine what they could sacrifice, cut out their Starbucks, cut out their Chick-fil-A, cut out their Tim Hortons, and, and, and limit it to this or that in the week. And they could figure out what they could, what they could pay monthly for the campaign. And then they could sacrifice and give an annual offering. And then there was a miracle number. And the miracle number wasn't what you sacrificed to give. The miracle number wasn't, it wasn't what you determined you could afford. The miracle was something completely out of your hands. And it was something only God could provide. And it was a number God would give us. And so I'm preaching this and we're leading the people through this program and and so now the time comes for us to give our miracle number. And when it came time for us to give our miracle number, the number the Lord gave me was more than I was comfortable with. And I began to question God and said, Lord, I, I'm already sacrificing for this number. We're already cutting things out and selling things and, and doing this and that for this number. How in the world are we going to achieve that number? And the Lord told me how. He said, you're going to sell your house. That's, that scared me. Because, you know, where are we going to live? But you know, we talked this morning, Brother Woodward, about this is our story. 
And I heard the elders tell the stories. Living in Sunday school rooms and living in, living in basements of churches. And I thought, well, I guess I'm going to have to pick a nice Sunday school room here in the church somewhere. <laughs> I hope Heidi likes it. And Of course, my wife is a missionary's kid. And, and when I told her, I said, honey, the Lord just told me we're going to sell our house to meet our miracle number. And I've watched her pour out her purse on the altar before. She's not afraid of sacrifice. And when I said that, her eyes widened. We're going to sell our house. And then she narrowed them and said, all right, then let's do what the Lord told us to do. I said, okay. So we started giving, and we were waiting for that miracle number to come in. That miracle number was supposed to come in, and it wasn't quite coming in just yet. And we were giving what we could and sacrificing here and there and cutting corners and giving and giving. And then COVID hit. And COVID, when COVID hit, something very unusual happened for me. My whole schedule changed, Bishop Woodward. You, you know what I'm talking about. That, everything canceled. Everything stopped. And for the first time in my adult life, I was home for an extended period of time. And I had time to spare. And we realized that if we were going to sell our house, this is the time to sell our house. And so we began to get our house ready to sell. And as we were preparing to sell our house and put it on the market and pack it up and fix it up and get it ready for market, something unusual happened in the American real estate market. The price on our house started going higher and higher and higher and higher, much higher than I ever expected our house to be worth. And when we sold our house, it was a blessing, not a sacrifice. I didn't have to live in a Sunday school classroom after all. I didn't have to live on cookies and Kool-Aid after all. Because when God told me you're going to sell the house, the whole time he was meaning I'm going to bless you. I feel like the Holy Ghost is reaching for somebody's heart right now. I feel like God is stirring somebody's soul right now. That God is moving upon you to do something extraordinary. To do something sacrificial. To do something like you've never done it before. And I want you to stop thinking of it as being a sacrifice. And I want you to know when you lay it down. It's a blessing in disguise. It feels like a sacrifice. It looks like a sacrifice. It sounds like a sacrifice. It's a number that sure does seem like a sacrifice. But it's not a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice. It's a resurrection waiting to happen. It's not a sacrifice. It, you're going to get paid in full price. We don't give for what we get. That's not why we give. But you just can't help it. When you give, the Lord is going to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you will not be able to contain. Hallelujah. One of my pastor friends was trying to raise money to, to, to move the mission in his church and, and to build a building. And, and, and while, he was, while he was raising this money, the Lord told him that afternoon, the Lord said, there's somebody here that's going to give a sacrificial offering tonight. And, and, and you're to wait until they give it. And that's kind of a scary prospect, but that's what he felt led of the Lord to do. So he stood up in his pulpit on that night and said, I can't get away from this. The Lord has shown me that there's somebody here that's going to give sacrificially to the cause of God tonight. And that we're not to move until, until you do it. And so he waited and they waited. And there was that awkward moment where everybody was wondering, who is it going to be? And all of a sudden, a young man stood up in the back, a teenager. It was the pastor's son. The pastor's son stood up in the back of the church, and the pastor looked at him and thought, what are you going to give? <laughs> and the pastor's son walked down the middle aisle and said, hey, Dad, you know how you said that the family jet ski is going to be mine when I turn a certain age? And he said, yes. He said, I don't want it. I want to give it to the mission. 
he said, could you sell the jet ski and give the money to missions? And the pastor looked out over the congregation and the congregation was so moved, one man in the back of the church shouted out, I'll pay for it. And he wrote a check. He said, how much, how much is it worth? He said, it's, it's honestly, it's probably $3,500. He wrote a check for $3,500. And he gave the check to the pastor. And he took the keys of the jet ski and put them in the hands of the young man and said, there's your jet ski. And the young man took the keys of the jet ski, threw them back up on the pulpit and said, sell it again, Dad. They sold that jet ski five times before that service was over, and he still ended up with the jet ski. What I'm trying to tell you is that God's not requiring of you something that you can't measure, something that you can't perform. He's trying to bless you. He's trying to bless you. He's trying to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you will not have room enough to contain. If you believe it, lift your hands unto him and praise him. If you believe it, shout unto him with the voice of triumph. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, shandarabasikalabohaya. Yeah, Ah, hallelujah. I want you to take those commitment cards that you received in this service and I want you to lift them up to the Lord. Could you do that? Our musicians can come. Our singers can come. Take those commitment cards you have. Lift them up to the Lord. If you need some more, we'll have them up here at the front. But God's getting ready to move in this house. God's getting ready to move in this house. Oh, New Brunswick. Oh, the missionaries you have sent throughout the world. New Brunswick. The revivals that have, that have caught a blaze all throughout the world because of the giving and the prayers of the people of this province. God bless you in Jesus' name. But this is a new generation and there are new missionaries, home missionaries and foreign missionaries. There are new events said new Sunday school teachers hallelujah there's new round top churches hallelujah there are new testimonies coming hallelujah and some of you are going to give the very dollars that are going to purchase the very vehicles that take missionaries around the world hey hey hear what I'm telling you God's going to multiply what you give I feel the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus name I feel the Holy Ghost do you remember just remain standing. I'm coming to a close. Do you remember when that young child brought the five loaves and the two fish to Jesus? And Jesus took them. He said, have we here any meat? And he took those loaves and fishes. And he was going to feed the multitudes with these loaves and fishes. He had thousands of people waiting to be fed. And they said, the only thing we have is some little kid has five loaves and two fishes. Maybe five bucks and a few quarters. That's all he's got. And the Bible says that Jesus took it and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it and he broke it and he multiplied it. And I'm going to tell you, the multiplication miracle factor, you see it in those words. It starts with, he gave thanks for it. Do you want what you have to multiply? Here's how it multiplies. Give God thanks for what you have. Jesus didn't take those five bucks and a few cents and say, well, what am I supposed to do with this? This isn't going to feed the masses. This isn't going to reach the multitudes. It's not what he did. No, no. When they brought in the five loaves and two fishes, he said, thank you for what you have provided and when we are truly, genuinely grateful for what God has given us, He can bless it. He can break it open. He can multiply it. 
and multitudes of people will be fed by what we give. I don't know what you have. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. I don't know what you have, but I want you to give it to the Lord. In Jesus' name, I want you just to give what you have to the Lord right now. In Jesus' name. I believe there's a revival of giving that's getting ready to open up in this congregation among young people in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to bring forward a sacrificial offering right now in the name of Jesus with your commitment card. If you have if you have commitment cards, bring the commitment cards in Jesus' name. Thank Him for what He's given you. Put it into the Master's hands. Come on, that's it. Come on, that's it. Come on, young people. Come on, young people. If you want to give a cash offering right now as well, I feel like God's going to open up the windows of heaven in this house. In Jesus' name. Some of you are going to give something right now that's going to be a blessing to you for the rest of your life. Some of you are going to give, a ble- give an offering right now that's going to be a blessing to you and your household for the rest of your life. When you come up to the front to give, I want you to stay up here. In Jesus' name. Come on, I'm opening up these altars. Somebody else come. Somebody else come. Somebody else come. It's a blessing. It's disguised as a sacrifice. We're going to give unto the Lord. We're going to move the mission in Jesus' name in 2022. Come on, I wonder if there's some elders here right now that will give unto the Lord. And show by example how you give, how you give, how you give. In Jesus' name. I want some elders that have given and you've seen the blessing of the Lord in your life. And you know what will happen if these young people will give unto the Lord. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? Could you lift up your hands unto him and praise him for his blessings? Come on up in the balcony. Somebody give him praise right now. Pashatala Bohaya. I believe that there are, I believe there are miracles happening. Miracles happening, miracles happening, miracles happening. I'm going to tell you that these commitments are going to travel. These commitments are going to travel years down the road. And somebody in Brazil is going to receive the Holy Ghost because of the mission moving forward in this service. Somebody in Kenya, Africa is going to be baptized in Jesus' name because of the mission that is moving forward from this moment. Go ahead, go ahead and give unto the Lord. Go ahead and give unto the Lord. Hallelujah. I believe there's going to be Bibles distributed in Asia because of what is happening in this service right now. There's going to be the deaf healed and the blind to see and the sick to be made whole because of what young people are doing in this service right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. That's it. God sees those tears. God sees those tears. That's it. That's a call of God coming on you right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Let the mission get a hold of you right now. Let the mission get a hold of you right now. Let the mission get a hold of you right now. You can't outgive God. You cannot outgive the Lord. Come on, that's it. Give, 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 give unto the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Come on, that's it. As we sing unto Him. As we praise Him. Yes, you meant to choose. I want to empty up myself. No fail of gold to you. Let me be. That's it. As you give, you're opening up something in the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is beginning to move. I want you to lay your heart out to Him in worship. Come on, pour your heart out to Him in worship. That's it. Pour your heart out to Him in worship. Yes. 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 Pour your heart out to Him in worship. Come on, that's it. Pour 
Oh, your heart out to him in worship. Oh, 